It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Morning. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the forces arrayed against progress. But why do radical right-wing movements like the Tea Party and the Moral Majority seem so much more effective at pushing their agenda into the mainstream? While the radical left throughout history, like the Occupy movement, anti-war activists, and abolitionists, has been dismissed as too idealistic and impractical. How do underdogs facing far stronger opponents sometimes win? Our first guest, Stephanie Luce, professor of labor studies at City University of New York, will be joining us to explain how. She, along with her fellow CUNY professor Deepak Bhargava, is co-author of the new book, Practical Radicals, Seven Strategies to Change the World. Practical Radicals is a handbook in the tradition of Saul Linsky's Rules for Radicals and Sun Tzu's The Art of War, and it offers winning strategies, history, and theory for a new generation of activists. Now, what does it take to steal from Medicare? In the second half of the program, we'll welcome Washington Post health reporter Dan Diamond. Mr. Diamond and his colleagues uncovered a scheme that cheated the Medicare program out of $2 billion. And we're going to find out how the deed was done. And we're going to close the show today with a visit from our good friend and resident constitutional law scholar, Bruce Fine. Bruce and Ralph are going to talk about the recent death of Russian dissident Alexei Navalny. As always, somewhere along the line, we'll check in with our unwavering corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, what can progressive activists learn from the art of war? David? Stephanie Luce is professor of labor studies at the School of Labor and Urban Studies and professor of sociology at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. Professor Luce is best known for her research on living wage campaigns and movements. She's the author of Fighting for a Living Wage and co-author of The Living Wage, Building a Fair Economy and the Measure of Fairness. Her latest book, co-authored with Deepak Bhargava, is Practical Radicals, Seven Strategies to Change the World. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Stephanie Luce. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome indeed, Stephanie. To our listeners, fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a pretty important interview. Let's start with your phrase, left practical radicals. What do you mean by that? Right. What we're talking about here are people who have big ideas about changing the world for the better, overthrowing systems of oppression, but also take the time to make a realistic strategy to win. Be realistic about the power that we have and the power of the forces we're up against. And so it means taking a long view and really taking the steps needed to achieve that big change in steps. Okay, and in your preface, you say the following, quote, We wrote this book because we think that the practice of rigorous strategy on the left has deteriorated in recent years. Organizers debate whether you can teach strategy at all, or if the ability is mostly innate. Our view is that great strategists are made, not born. Strategy can be taught, and strategists can get better, can get better with practice. Some students learn through reading, some through lectures, but most Everyone really starts to, quote, get it, quote, when working together in groups to put the concepts into practice. We've compiled and created tools across different traditions of social change and borrowed and adapted lessons from the military in Silicon Valley, too. We think the ideas in the book are most likely to stick when you use the tools, end quote. A couple questions on that excerpt, Stephanie. What lessons did you apply from the military in Silicon Valley? Well, we read through a lot of their strategy thinking and a lot, I want to say, first of all, we don't want to adapt their values. We don't want to adapt a lot of the terrible things, but they put a lot of work into training strategists. Some things they do are meant to disarm their opponents. We use a tool called OODA loops, which is really about observing the opponent and really finding a way to intervene in a way that confuses and disorients. We know the military uses that for terrible purposes in other cases. So we don't, you know, again, we're not saying like adopt it wholesale, 
but we could learn some of that technique of our own as underdogs to say, how are we going to observe our opponents and disorient them and to throw them off to do things that they're not expecting? In terms of Silicon Valley, they have tools such as reverse engineering, which actually is not just Silicon Valley, but comes out of the business world, which is you're starting with the end product, a finalized engine, a finalized computer. And how do we work backwards, do the reverse engineering to get to that product we want to get to? So we work with our students to say, you know, what's the world we want in 10 years? Where do we want to be? Rather than being on these defensive fights all the time, let's look at where we want to be in 10, 20 years. And then what do we need to do backwards to build the power to get there? Well, that's interesting. In other words, you're not endorsing what they're doing to our country and world, Silicon Valley and the military. You're just focusing on how they manage to get it done and what they use to revise their options and learn from what they consider are their failures, like reverse engineering. Now, you properly say this is not a how-to book. This is not a book that says, here's how to put on a press conference. Here's how to organize a petition drive for initiatives. This is not that kind of how-to book. There's plenty of how-to books on that practical level of fortifying civic initiatives. But there is one gap, and I'd like to get your view on this. There's such a thing as a civic personality that is a huge Achilles heel of the drive to train people civically. You can train people civically just as you have outlined in this book, Practical Radicals, Seven Strategies to Change the World by New Press. But if they don't have a civic personality, if they don't have fire in their belly, so to speak, emotional intelligence, if they don't have a framework of a public philosophy, if they don't have a capacity for resilience to learn from their last mistakes, if they haven't controlled their ego so they can give credit to other people in their circle and set an example and motivate, if they're not willing to read and stay up to date with what's going on in their fields and in the area of their opponents, it doesn't matter how many skills they learn from our efforts. What's your view of the civic personality issue? Well, that's a great point. It's an interesting idea. I think that, you know, what I see, I teach at the City University of New York, and a lot of our students are full-time workers. Some of them are union members active in their workplaces. A lot of them have never been really asked to engage in leading organizations or asked to help think about strategy or asked to take a part in directing their own lives. And I think I've watched people really develop those traits that you're talking about. Maybe they don't come into it with those skills of, you know, reading the latest and self-reflection or assessing their errors, but you can see people learn well in the right context and to learn quickly and to learn at any age. And so I'm not sure if you're suggesting there's something inherent about that personality, but I think what I've seen a lot of is If you open up the space to people who haven't had access to that mentorship and training, there's a big pool of people out there, and you're going to find a sizable number of people who are going to develop that kind of fire in the belly, as you say, and be willing to stick with it and develop the skills they need to stay in the fight for the long term. Well, there's a passage, again, in your preface that begins to touch on this, and it says, quote, and you're talking about concerned progressive people. Quote, for such a strategy, they substitute militancy, but militancy is a matter of posture and volume and not of effect. Practical radicals are not content to be on the right side without a plan to make their vision a reality, and they're not satisfied with working on small issues without an analysis of what's wrong with society and a vision of how it could be better, end quote. Well, some would substitute militancy with an emotional intelligence, which is very key. You can know a lot of things in your mind, but if you don't have that emotional intelligence, that drive to persist, you're going to just waste the information that you have in your mind. And that's true in terms of the history of civic activity. I mean, you can point to any drive for justice in our country's history and see who the leaders were that move to achieve it. And then you can say to yourself, you know, there are thousands of other people who knew as much, if not more, than these civic leaders, but they didn't have the fire in their belly, which is part of what a civic personality is all about. 
So you're properly critical of people who protest and demand, but they don't have a strategy to carry it to the next stage and then the next stage. So let's talk about your seven strategies. On paper, they look like they're pretty academic, and this book is obviously very good for college and high school and graduate school classes on civic issues, and teaching of civics is disappearing fast in the elementary and high school in our country, as is the teaching of history, all in favor of STEM and learning how to be computer software cogs in large corporate wheels. But listeners, she's going to describe, I hope, Stephanie will describe these briefly. She has them outlined around page 302 in the book. The first strategy is base building. The second is disruptive movement. The third is narrative shift. The fourth is electoral change. The fifth is inside-outside campaigns. The sixth is momentum. And the seventh is collective care. You want to start and describe them one by one and see if you can give an example or two. Base building, number one. Sure. Yeah, this is what we call the fundamental strategy, the one that most people in social change know of. It's built on what we call solidarity power, the power that comes in numbers. So most people would know this as a community organization, a labor union, perhaps a faith-based organization. And this is really the, the strategy here is that we can win by outnumbering our opponents. And to do that, we have to build those relationships with one another and stick together and you know, essentially hold the line, so to speak. The second strategy, what we call disruptive movements, is the idea of winning things by shutting things down, by forcing our opponents to come to the table to negotiate or to give in to our demands. And we see this maybe in the form of large-scale labor strikes, but it could also take other forms of social disruption, such as in the civil rights movement, sit-ins at lunch counters, and things like that. And it's really about stopping the status quo from functioning. The narrative change, and I will say this is one I myself came a bit late to and slow to believe in because I sometimes think it's, sometimes people think it's just getting a smart ad or a clever campaign. But really what we mean here is helping people make sense of the world. How do they make meaning of their own histories? Who do they consider they're a part of? Who's the we? Who's the villain? What are they fighting for? And so this is a way to really lead to change by changing our understanding of history and, you know, who's in power. And so we give the example of Occupy Wall Street, which really did not shut down Wall Street. So it wasn't disruptive in that sense, but it began to shift the narrative about who was to blame for the 2008 economic crisis and led to other kinds of movements to start regulating the financial industry or fighting for student debt and these kinds of things. The fourth one I think is a little easier for most people to understand electoral change. And we're raising it here as a standard way to make change, but we critique the model that you often see that's very candidate driven by the two parties. And it's a very rote model that doesn't really involve people. It doesn't build a base. It doesn't really engage people in politics in governance. So we're talking about electoral change as being the power to govern. And alongside that, inside outside, is when you have a few sympathetic legislators to work with, you can work with them to pass major legislation that can have a big impact on people's lives, whether it is a minimum wage law, healthcare access, you know, or it could be to stop fracking, things like this. It's working with the outside social movements to pressure legislators to make change. The momentum model is an idea that's been around a long time, but has a new, you know, newly named as the momentum model in the last decade or so. And this is trying to really bring in the combination of the base building to bring in lots of volunteers, lots of activists to really change the understanding of a big issue, such as around the marriage equality issue, such as movements to take down dictators in other countries, like taking out Milosevic, Serbia and really trying to mobilize lots of people to undermine the pillars that support the status quo and make change quickly. And it's a bit of base building because you're bringing in a lot of people, but you're also creating structures that can move quickly and fast. And then the final strategy, which we added late, which is collective care. A lot of people critique this one. They think it's just about taking care of one another as part of life. That's what we do. We're arguing it can also be strategic because what it does is when done well, it enables people to engage in a fight in the long term. It, you know, you can't go on strike if you don't have someone to watch your children 
or if you don't have a strike fund, you can't risk arrest if you don't know if you have bail. So collective care is a way of taking care of one another, doing the things that enable us to take risks and to know people have our back. And that helps us up our militancy and strategy because we can take bigger risks and build the capacity for other kinds of struggle. Okay, that's a very good summary. Now, let's get to the core of my criticism of this book. What is, in your view, in Deepak Bhargava's view, your co-author, think is the main power structure that has to be challenged across the entire range of trying to achieve a more just society? How would you describe the main power structure? Yeah, the main power structure we lay out in the book is, you know, talking about the notion of racial capitalism, which really sets up the system of exploitation of the planet. It sets up the exploitation of people, and it really impedes real democracy. So that can take different forms. We also talk about how it's looked in the last 30 years in a more neoliberal form. But this really kind of undermines a lot of the major struggles that we're facing now. And that's partly why we're saying we need to have these different strategies, because we need to take on this massive system of oppression from many different angles. Do you think the problem is capitalism, or do you think the problem is a handful of giant corporations spanning the globe, controlling governments, buying politicians, controlling much of the media, and in other ways, I'm going to put before you, creating a corporate state, which is the unification of big business taking over big government and turning the government against its own people. My father was owner of a restaurant, bakery, delicatessen. He was a capitalist. There are a lot of small businesses who are capitalists. No culture in the world survives without a marketplace. My sister, Laura Nader, who's taught anthropology at University of California, Berkeley for 60 years or so, and her most popular course was called Controlling Processes. And she let the students discover the various ways that corporations control their lives, starting with student loans, the credit card, gulag, et cetera. And she made this point, that the academic literature by progressive scholars almost entirely ignores the civic groups on the ground. And I say entirely because they don't ignore the civil rights aspect and racial and gender issues and people struggling. But for example, in your index, there is no reference to any of our groups, which is rather extraordinary. There's no reference to common cause, public citizen, no reference to the PERGs, the public interest research groups around the country that represent the most effective student movement in American history because they're organized, they have budgets, they have full-time staff, They're run by a student-elected board of directors. They're outside the university. They're independent nonprofit groups. We're talking with Professor Stephanie Luce, the co-author with Deepak Bhargava. The book is called Practical Radical, Seven Strategies to Change the World. came out in November by the New Press. And let me give you a context here. There has never been more corporate power dominating our country than today, slavery accepted in the pre-Civil War. For example, there is no government agency in Washington whose outside force that is the most powerful on these departments and agencies is not corporate power. Even the Department of Labor and OSHA, the corporations have more power over those two agencies by far than the FLCIO and the labor unions. The corporations now permit no commercial free zone. Years ago, they would not intrude on organized religion. They would not try to raise our children bypassing parents and subjecting these children to direct marketing of lethal products, junk food, junk drink, violent programming, and now five to seven hours a week on the iPhone with their addictive inducement. They are strategically planning, of course, our electoral system, our government system, Big corporations, that's what they do. They strategically plan. They crave control and predictability. They're strategically planning our housing industry. They're strategically planning our tax system. They want to strategically plan our energy by persisting with fossil fuels, even in the face of overwhelming evidence of climate violence traceable to global warming from the burning of fossil fuels. 
They are strategically planning our land policy. They control what we own as a commons. They control the public lands. We're the owner. They're the leasees of oil, gas, timber, grazing. They control our public airways. We own the public airways over which radio and TV stations transmit. Their programs 24-7, and guess what? We have been compelled by Congress and the FCC to give them licenses that are free to use the very profitable public airways, and they decide who says what, when, where, 24 hours a day. They're strategically planning our foreign policy, military policy, as much as they can. They certainly have strategically planned the powerlessness of their shareholders, including institutional shareholders like Fidelity, Teachers Retirement, Pension Plans, have been stripped of the power of ownership over these corporations, and they're getting away with it. They have now destroyed our freedom of contract with fine print contracts that youngsters are now instructed to sign by Zuckerberg's Facebook or Meta at a very young age. They even control the language that we use. We call exploitive sellers that are drug companies and hospital chains, we call them providers, providers. We call the corporate dominated area of our society the private sector. We call corporate crime white collar crime. So this is, unfortunately, a longer way of asking you the question, what about corporate power and the only institution that can really begin changing this, given our Constitution, which is the U.S. Congress? Well, I think that we don't have any disagreement with you that corporate power is a massive problem. If we can even start with that, that's fine. And and I would say, you know, my co-author and I don't even necessarily share the same analysis of the fundamental root problems, but I think we're both on board with you that this would be a huge start, which is regulating corporate power. I don't think we can do it alone through Congress. I just, you know, obviously we have to change the Constitution and change the way things are set up. And I know you don't believe this either. We can't do it just by electing people. We also have to have the other forms of protest of building all kinds of organizations, you know, not just, you know, labor unions and community groups, but organizing in the churches, organizing in the neighborhoods. I am fine with the idea that that's centered around regulating corporations in a massive way or restructuring the way that we have corporations. That all seems great. You know, I think our approach to this book is really centering people who are most impacted by the negative trends going on in society and bringing them into the fight and helping them see past or how they can imagine a world that isn't dominated by corporations. And then what will it take to get there? We find it's actually hard to get people to imagine those kinds of really liberatory worlds because there's, like you said, we're so dominated by corporate culture and consumer culture and undemocratic functioning that it's hard to imagine a world that's different. So even just getting people to dream of a different possibility is a good start. And then we have to think about what kind of power it's going to take to make those changes. Well, as you know, the corporations have gotten the courts to treat them as persons under the Constitution when they're just artificial entities, what the lawyers call legal fictions. And they're given all the rights of real human beings under the Constitution. Then they acquire through their power of capital, technology, and labor immunities, impunities, and all kinds of other powers that make any contest between individuals and corporations a pretty difficult one to envision. So that's one change that has to be made in our Constitution. There's no mention of company or corporation in the Constitution at all. The question to ask people is, then why people do you think they should control us? The only mention is we the people and the word persons. And they've hijacked the Constitution to give them all the rights and remedies, plus all their awesome political, technological, and capital power to defeat us. That's the way you start talking. And then you get right down to the debt ridden economy. You get down to all the problems that people have because of corporate ravages and greed, where they live, work, and raise their family, which tends to elicit left-right support because conservative and liberal families want pretty much the same thing. And when they are harmed, they bleed the same color, regardless of whether they're in the red state or blue state. And then you talk to them about how they've lost the ability to bargain 
that now they're incarcerated by the credit card payments gulag under fine print contracts that are enforceable in court if you dare challenge the seller that you're dealing with. And increasingly, they're blocking access to the court by restricting the law of wrongful injury or tort law, among other ways, starving court budgets down to 2% of the state budgets in terms of the minimization of the access to justice by ordinary people. So it's a good way to propose a five-hour course for high school students about corporate power, how it affects their lives. My sister, Claire Nader, wrote a book recently called You're Your Own Best Teacher, Sparking the Imagination and Intellect of Tweens. And it's directed to these 9, 10, 12, 11, 12 year olds in terms of the power structure that's affecting them every day, what food they eat, how they look at the world, how the world looks at them. So let's get back to this one point, Stephanie. Why does the academic world, who have progressive publications like How Democracies Die by two Harvard professors, they never recognize the progressive civic groups in Washington, D.C., that know a little bit about strategy and tactics and have actually have achieved things. Why is there such a gap? Between the academic world and the activist world? Yeah, yeah. because you've bridged both. You should know the answer to this question because uh, it's puzzling us. So what's the lack of connection here, which is functionally very, very harmful to the civic movement on the ground? Well, certainly the corporations are behind a lot of the universities as well and behind the academic research, what gets funded, what gets published, what gets supported. There's certainly a corporate bias in every element of society, so that certainly is in the academic world as well. I certainly saw it, you know, teaching in labor studies. We uh, are under a lot more scrutiny sometimes than the business schools, that's for sure. So, yeah, I think it's just a real challenge as to what the academy respects and privileges. And it's, it's a real problem. And before we get to Steve and David and Hannah's question, just one more here. In our desperate attempt to motivate new citizens, we talk about Occupy Wall Street. That's, you know, citizen groups do that. Academic studies do that. You do that in your book. We talk about the Seattle rally challenging and putting on the media map the horrors of corporate managed foreign trade how it's hollowed out communities and sent jobs over to fascist and communist dictatorships who know how to put workers in their place in those countries. Talk about Black Lives Matter and the millions of people who demonstrated. And in the judgment of some of us, that's all true, but it's basically at the skirmish level. Most of those movements didn't have legs. They didn't create new civic advocacy groups. They didn't raise more money. The investment in civic activity is trivial compared to what they're up against in the corporate world and the money going into the political world by corporate donations and secret PACs and all that. Why do you think our side keeps trumpeting these very valiant but very minor movements that really don't go anywhere? Occupy Wall Street, it, it should have moved into the minimum wage struggle when it was in the eye of the mass media. And I spoke to about 200 of these people. Occupy Wall Street had its, as you know, its tents in places all over the country, not just near Wall Street. And I said, look, you've got the eye of the media like no other group in recent years. Why don't you move for a federal minimum wage? And they both said, we're nowhere near that organized, Ralph. And they chuckled, and they were probably right. But here's the federal minimum wage, although the states have changed some of the minimum wage and it's gone to 15 in some areas, it's still $7.25. What does that say about the organized labor movement and the progressive citizen movement? I agree with you on the point about, you know, there's a lot more attention given to these big protests than other kinds of organization. I mean, they are flashy and they're, they catch people's eye because they are in your face, right? So that will catch the media attention. But I think there has been academic work showing that these kinds of large protests have been less effective over the last decade or so for various reasons. And so people have done other research on, you know, why is that? What, when do these protests win? When do they not? Do they spur other things? And I actually do think Occupy Wall Street had a pretty big impact in 
sparking the fight for 15 movement. So a lot of people went from Occupy and said, okay, we need to go into things like fight for 15, raising wages in cities and states. Some of them went into the Bernie Sanders campaign. Some of them went into the student debt campaign. So I think that, you know, we don't necessarily need to think them as opposites. They can be supporting each other. A large protest brings in new people who hadn't been engaged before. And then not all of them, but many of them can then channel into building institutions or joining existing institutions. Still, however, to be directly realistic, which is the theme of your book, overall, corporate power is becoming ever more dominant. Look at the military and foreign policy, which is not much covered in your book. Look what's going on in the world. How would you characterize your book's relevance to U.S. military and foreign policy? especially what's going on in Israel, Gaza at the present time. Just to take one example, how would your book help Jewish Voice for Peace and other groups around the country who are, if not now, for example, we've had both on our programs, other groups who are building a tremendous public opinion for a ceasefire, humanitarian aid, two-state solution. It's getting into the 70% level, 80% of Democrats are want to cease fire. And the complete rejection of that by the dominant majority in the U.S. Congress, Republicans, Democrats, and by Joe Biden. Could you give us your views on that? Yeah, unfortunately, I wish I could give you a good answer here. I certainly would love to have one. I think that what these organizations, Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, they're doing the terrific work of they're saying, like, how do we look at the, the forces that are upholding the war in Gaza, how can we divide those? How can we peel off the elements of support? You know, whether it's members of Congress, whether it's city councils, labor unions, let's go after all of these different pillars of power in society and peel them off one by one to bring them to our side. It still has not resulted in a ceasefire as we know. So I don't have a quick answer for you here, but I think what they're doing is right, which is taking a diversity of tactics, and trying to divide the ruling coalition and play them against one another. No doubt they've done what no one has done in decades on this issue, and they have transformed public opinion. They've connected with the civil rights movement, the Native American rights movement, and we applaud them for that. But they've also illustrated how powerfully entrenched the militaristic interests And I'm not just talking about the pro-Israeli government right or wrong lobby. I'm talking about the defense industry. It's making so much money off these U.S. taxpayer-financed weapon systems to Israel. And if they pass the $14 billion genocide tax, even more so. So this is the, the most powerful civic challenge since the 1940s on U.S. military and foreign policy in the Middle East. And it's hardly changed anything in Washington, D.C., which indicates how much work has to be done. And this book, this main message, listeners, you should give it to your local library. You should make it part of a book club discussion in your living room. And the main theme of this book is, look, democracy is not just something to intone. It requires work. And work requires strategy. It requires developing stamina. It requires continuing to endure loss after loss after loss, as Eugene Debs instructed us, until we win. It requires resiliency. And that's the message of this book, Practical Radical, Seven Strategies to Change the World. Dave? Professor Lewis, what is the main difference between strategies on the left and strategies on the right? Well, one thing is that the strategies on the right not all of them, but many of them are fine being authoritarian and top down, that the democracy is not necessarily a value of the right. And so that means that the, some of the, you know, the work of bringing in more voices, of representing more voices is less of an issue or not an issue at all. And again, not all left-wing strategies are democratic either, but on the most part, they're built on the idea of expanding and including more people and more voices. So that shapes what we can do. The other big difference is the strategies on the right are generally backed by the status quo. They're backed by the resources, controlling production, controlling the wealth, and controlling the courts and the laws. And so they have a lot more tools on their side. And the strategies on the left are generally, we call them underdog strategies because it's fighting the status quo. David? Professor Luce, 
Henry Ford, his union bashing notwithstanding, said he paid his workers a livable wage because well-paid workers buy cars. Two-thirds of our GDP is what American consumers purchase. So we always assume that corporate CEOs are evil geniuses, but is it possible they're not as smart as we automatically assume? Is it possible we're up against ill-informed idiots? And if so, how do we defeat ignorance in the, the C-suite, the corporate suites? Well, for sure, I don't think they're all geniuses. That's for sure. <laughs> and a lot of them are not long-term strategies of their own. They're just simply responding to the markets on a daily basis, very short-term thinking. A lot of them are undermining their own interests in the long term by pursuing that short-term profit. But the challenge is that they have all these, as I just said, like they have everything stacked in their favor. So the constitution has been interpreted in their favor, as Ralph said, the courts generally rule in their favor. I think your initial point here is about, you know, consumer spending. Can we wield that as an economic weapon? And I do think we've used the power of the consumer in ways effectively in the past, such as whether it's the bus boycott in the civil rights movement, the great boycott, it can be used. I just think it's much harder to do because often, you know, the, that corporate power is obscured. We don't really even know for sure who's pulling what strings behind which corporation. And so really being effective in the targeting is a challenging to do. I think we should keep boycotts on the table as a strategy or pension work as a strategy. It's just it has to be done with a really sharp research to figure out who's the appropriate. Anna? Professor Luth. As a young person in America, we're told to, to dream big. And reading some, you know, some of the case studies in your book, I'm curious if there isn't more value in dreaming small. A lot of the issue-based organizations, issue-based activist groups that are so successful and radical seem to lose their teeth when they try to get big. Looking at the gay men's health crisis and ACT UP, the modern iteration organizations like Housing Works you know, fight against their own staff unionizing. So is, I guess, maybe treating gay men's health crisis as, as a case study, what would your response be to the, my question about maybe dreaming small is, is a way to stay radical and practical? Use your terminology. Yeah, I love that question. It's a great one. I think for us, we would say that the trick is the, in the getting the balance right between the two, because you know, the small fights are absolutely important and we're forced into them. We're forced into defensive struggles. We're forced into trying to improve our wages and working conditions, whether even if it's for a supposedly good nonprofit, we need to engage in those fights because they're often for our survival or our daily needs. The question we're thinking is how do we get beyond just those small and defensive fights so that we're not so pushed into the corner and always fighting the defensive fights and making these hard choices? Can we, in fact, do both at the same time, where we have the bigger dreams, where we want to win, you know, healthcare for all, for example, but then that's far off. And so how do we do the small steps that build to that? So the each small fight is bringing in new people to the fight, changing the narrative, building our infrastructure, building our leadership, building the capacity so that each of those small fights is not just a small fight of its own, but building something more powerful. Just the cases of a, these, a lot of workers fighting their employers to unionize in these small workplaces, that's important. But even if they succeed, the workplace can shut down. And so we need larger structural changes that also give workers protections that aren't so dependent on the employer. And what's your view of third parties as an avenue into the electoral system in Congress and state legislatures and city councils? So this is one of the areas that I personally was first involved in as an activist, helping to form what was called Progressive Dane and Progressive Wisconsin, a third party in Wisconsin. And it was a uh, very near and dear to my heart. We won a lot at the local level. We won school board, city council, city council races. You know, it just was such a challenge to compete financially at the higher levels that that avenue still, I find very you know, a hard nut to crack, which is how do we really compete at a higher level at a, as a third party without that kind of institutional backing, those financial resources. So it feels chicken and egg, which is how do we make a more fair system where we can actually compete as a third party, but it's kind of like we need the third party to do that. It's a real chicken and egg problem. Well, in the past, we've tried our bit, like you're doing with your book, Practical Radicals, 
I wrote a little paperback about 10 years ago called Breaking Through Power is Easier Than We Think, giving all kinds of historical and contemporary examples on how a few people representing public opinion for a more just outcome in a particular area managed to connect their strategy to the decision makers and got the situation changed, like getting lead out of gasoline and paint, for example, is one successful example that we can point to. We have to start the way you're trying to start with bringing more people into the civic arena, trying to replace civic apathy with civic energy and infusing them with a level of optimism. We have to be very realistic before we are able to raise the very powerful expectation levels in a civic community that is the bedrock of getting things underway. Why don't you give our listeners how they can access your study guide? on your website, slowly. Sure. So if you go to www.practicalradicals.org, you can find a link to a study guide, as well as some audio interviews with some of the organizers that we interview in the book. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Stephanie Luce, professor of sociology at CUNY in New York, co-author with Deepak Bhargava, of Practical Radical, Seven Strategies to Change the World. Give it to your local library and start study sessions about it and connect it with your own concerns in your community. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. We've been speaking with Stephanie Luce. We will link to her book, Practical Radicals, at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, we are joined by our resident constitutional scholar and friend of the show, Bruce Fine. He and Ralph are going to talk about the death of Russian dissident Alexei Navalny. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime reporter morning minute for Friday, February 23, 2024. I'm Russell Mokhyber. A new environmental working group study has found that Cormaquat, a little-known pesticide, is in four out of five or 80 percent of people tested. The analysis of Cormaquat in the bodies of people in the United States rings alarm bells because the chemical is linked to reproductive and developmental problems in animal studies, suggesting the potential for similar harm to humans. The group tested for the presence of Cormaquat in urine collected from 96 people between 2017 and 2023. The chemical was found in the urine of 77 of them. Just as troubling, the group detected the chemical in 92% of oat-based food products, including Quaker Oats and Cheerios. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Hannah and Ralph. We're going to close the show today with a visit from our good friend and resident constitutional law scholar, Bruce Fine. Bruce and Ralph are going to talk about the recent death of Russian dissident Alexei Navalny. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Bruce Fine. Thank you. Bruce, in your travels around the world with your work in international law practice, you've seen a lot of courageous people who stand up to dictatorships, to corporate despots, and take great risks to stand for principles of justice. What's your view of the career of Alexei Navalny, who suddenly was found deceased in an Arctic prison under orders of Vladimir Putin at the age of 47. Well, my experience is that uh, Navalny is at the summit of courage. He uniquely had an opportunity to resist returning to Russia, knowing that he would be targeted by Putin, who was notorious already for killing critics. And he returned anyway. He was in Germany. He'd been treated for ailments poisoning by Putin. He didn't have to return. Now, I've met dissidents who have fled under attack, under assault, but he's the only one I know who, in a composed, fearless way, looked death in the eye and walked right towards it, saying, fear is not in my body. Why did he do this? I believe that he believed that justice and the good of the Russian people In the long run, after centuries, if not longer, of tyranny, of oppression, lack of free speech, the upside was worth it. 
It was his entire being. It's really stunning that he lived as long as he did, given the very acute, harsh conditions under which he lived without medical treatment. And I believe it's because he had such an enormous pride and ambition to do something that would be lasting for all the Russian people, you know, not selfish whatsoever, that enabled him to survive without being bitter, without being resentful, as long as he did. In my view, he's virtually on a par with Socrates taking the hemlock for free speech. He definitely didn't want to be part of the group of Russian dissident exiles in other countries because he felt that his duty to the people of Russia required his presence and to be part of the risk. That's right. If you look at the other heroes, I mean, take Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and I surely do not want at all disparage you know, his courage and bravery writing despite the knowledge that he would be punished. He Ultimately, he left Russia under the communists, came to the United States. He returned later when he didn't confront, you know, the same kind of prior status that Navalny had. Now, Sakharov, he stayed in the Soviet Union. He was kind of off limits a little bit because he was the developer of nuclear weapons. And the Soviet Union really is not a superpower without nuclear weapons. But Navalny is the one who was free. He knew he could have left. He probably could have won a Nobel Peace Prize. He returned anyway. And the pride in which I can express in such a human being is beyond words. Well, he was held in a cold, damp cell, solitary confinement near the Arctic in a penal colony in a cell that was about three meters by three meters. Just imagine that. With inadequate medical treatment, and you can only imagine what kind of food he was given. And the circumstances of his death are being reported as directly or indirectly caused by orders from the Kremlin. Is there any legal remedy here, domestic or international? Well, what we know is this, that number one, the conditions of his incarceration are tantamount to torture under the Convention Against Torture. Without a doubt, solitary confinement, very, very severe deprivation of the bare necessities, including medical. And if you're the victim of torture, and I believe also especially reinforced by the newspapers today showing a defector from the Russian armed forces to Ukraine and then to Spain suddenly gets assassinated. It looks like another hit job from Mr. Putin. Same way he ordered you know, the shooting down of a plane, a Malaysian plane, killed 300. He's poisoned people in Great Britain. So he truly is worse than the Borgia folks poisoning all their enemies. So what is the remedy? Well, we do have in the United States uniquely a Torture Victim Protection Act, which would enable any of the persons involved in the torture and killing of Navalny to be sued. The difficulty you have at present is personal jurisdiction. If they've never come to the United States and don't have any contacts, you really have a tough personal jurisdiction issue unless Congress amends the statute like I've urged them to do to say that when you have a universal crime like torture, extradition, killing, it constructively occurs everywhere in the world, including the United States, and there is personal jurisdiction. Now, absent that, there's obviously the International Criminal Court. In my view, this is clearly part of a pattern, a crime against humanity. We already have Mr. Putin being indicted by the International Criminal Court for his actions in Ukraine. However, the International Criminal Court doesn't have any enforcement mechanism, and I don't think any of us on this program think he's really going to be you know, hailed before the International Criminal Court for a trial, you know, unless he's overthrown or we actually, I don't think the world would survive if we attack Russia. The, the nuclear winter would soon emerge. So we basically have the ability to respond you know, indirectly. I think, stupidly, uh, we're likely to become lawless ourselves. I think there'll be enormous pressure on President Biden to basically steal the Russian money that's in central bank accounts, uh, even though it's not authorized by the International Economic Emergency Powers Act. And even the worst crimes don't enable you to steal the property of the criminal. You can sentence them to prison. You can have a trial. You can impose a fine after there's due process. But I think that's what Biden is going to be inclined to do. And they're up, not just the United States, but collectively, the central banks have about $300 billion in Russian dollars, if you will, assets uh, that could be confiscated. And then they'll use the money to buy weapons to Ukraine. So 
will be even more proficient in the killing fields of Ukraine than before. I mean, and this is the human species, I say, that prides itself in being superior to lions and tigers, really. Now, other things that could happen would be attempts to impose even more draconian economic sanctions on access or the selling of Russian oil and gas. But we already know from stories that it's very, very leaky situation with regard to sanctions. We don't have the manpower. When you have a enormous financial incentive to evade sanctions because the monetary reward is so great, they basically are dropped in the ocean. We see that with regard to drug trafficking. We spend trillion dollars since the war on drugs, on drug trafficking interdiction, and we got the same magnitude of the problem that we started out with. Because the demand is there. There's one area that you haven't covered. Some countries recognize universal jurisdiction under international law, Spain, for example. And if Putin goes to one of those countries, he could be arrested. Is that correct? Correct. But he's already under that. Right now, um, Ralph, because Putin is under indictment by the International Criminal Court for abduction of children in Ukraine, among other things, he's already subject. He was subject to that before he murdered Navalny. And I would say this is not a death. I mean, you'd have to be, I think, Ichabod Crane, who hadn't lived for the last 20 years, knowing what's going on, not to know that Vladimir Putin ordered the death, just like he did Pregobin when he died in the, in the plane crash. I mean, we're dealing with somebody who's unreluctant to be as barbaric and openly acknowledge it as you can imagine. Did yeah. Alexei Navalny ever ask to meet Putin? Well, I looked at that, Ralph, and I couldn't find any indication that he had actually asked. I don't, I, I believe that probably his attitude was, why would I meet with, it, it would be kind of a, giving him a dignity that he didn't deserve because he doesn't really have any moral legitimacy as president of Russia. Because Wait a minute. All of yeah, this... Navalny taunted Putin repeatedly, sometimes with mordant humor, and it would be in line with his belief that Putin was a, a coward for him to challenge Putin to meet with him at the well, Kremlin. I, 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 I do not see that that has happened. I understand that it would be. Certainly, he was not reluctant to ridicule Putin, you know, the party of crooks and thieves, you know, the billions of dollars that he spends on himself and on the policy. But also, you'd have to, on the other side, it would make it appear that, okay, if he's meeting Putin in his capacity as the president of Russia, then he's tacitly agreeing he is president. I don't think that in Navalny's mind, he was. He's there artificially simply because of the power of a gun. Why acknowledge you know, his legitimacy? He obviously was willing to run, try to run against him in political campaigns, but Putin blocked any of that kind of avenue of redress. But I, well, I certainly that note, it's important to say that Navalny's wife, who is in exile, has assumed the mantle for his legacy in leading the way with others for a more democratic and just Russia. Thank you very much, Bruce Fine. Thank you, Ralph. Bruce, if we have just a second, Francesco had a question. Yeah. You speak very highly of Navalny's bravery and standing up to Putin, comparing him to Socrates. What about his deplorable past comments about Muslims being equivalent to cockroaches? And similarly, praise Solzhenitsyn, but was he not a virulent anti-Semite? I don't know whether Solzhenitsyn was a virulent anti-Semite. Surely at the time he wrote and Solzhenitsyn was dedicated you know, to the Orthodox Russian church, which he thought was, I think, much superior than I would evaluate it. But we're not talking about saints. Even Socrates had his blemish. He was a little bit prideful that the oracles of Delphi told him he was the wisest man in all of Athens and scorned others because they believed they knew things that they didn't know. So I agree with your observation that Solzhenitsyn did have his blemishes. I don't really think that he was comfortable with majority rule. He had kind of a superiority complex, but we're dealing with you know matters of degree. And in terms of courage, I don't think you'd get a whole lot of people who would have done what he did in confronting Putin. But I say, I really do not think that the circumstantial evidence is any less than beyond a reasonable doubt. Nobody in their right mind doesn't understand Putin ordered this. Every bit as much as MBS ordered the killing of Khashoggi. Really, underlings are going to decide on their own to kill somebody that prominent. Doesn't happen in terrorists. No. Right. It's, you remember, it goes back to Henry II. 
Who rid me of this turbulent priest? Suddenly, Beckett dies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's obvious his transfer to an Arctic penal colony was just the setup. Yeah. I want to thank our guests again, Stephanie Luce, Dan Diamond, and Bruce Fine. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up, featuring our very own Francesco DeSantis with, in case you haven't heard, a transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. The American Museum of Tort Law has gone virtual. Go to tortmuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. We have a new issue of the Capitol Hill Citizen. It's out now. To order your copy of the Capitol Hill Citizen, Democracy Dies in Broad Daylight, go to CapitolHillCitizen.com. And remember, Ralph wants you to know to continue the conversation after each show, go to the comments section at RalphNaderRadioHour.com and post a comment or question on this week's episode. We read them all. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. The latest edition of Capital Citizen is out. Hot off the presses and print only. You can get a table of contents by going to CapitalCitizen.com. And if you like it, you can order single copies or multiple copies for your civic action circle back in your community. I have an article on collectively Congress as a weapon of mass destruction with multiple warheads. I say collectively because there are always a few exceptions in the House and Senate that are horrified by Congress's uniform impact on domestic and foreign conditions.